Welcome back, another episode of Moving the Needle Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Nettling, but we uh, we know you're not here for me. And I've got a pioneer in the mountain bike world, free ride. Well, he was racing first, then it was sort of free ride, yeah. then he invented his career. Super iconic feature, I think, in the mountain bike industry, Mr. Aaron Chase. Dude, welcome to the show, number one. Thank it's you. It's been far too long, number two. I know, it totally has been. Good to see you. Yeah, I'm, uh, I keep saying it's a sort of a byproduct of the podcast is to sort of reconnect with uh, faces I would have seen at the race circuit or at slope style events like Crankworks or whatever it be. And I guess it is a good excuse for us to get on a call and maybe catch up as well as break down what mountain bike sort of meant for you. For sure. The old good old days, because that was so much fun racing and everything else. Uh, I had a blast doing it. Um but man, racing's tough. Racing is tough. But you started in the racing side. I mean, that's you'd already transitioned when we crossed paths, like at those Lenowski jams and all those things on the East Coast. I mean, I don't know when we would have crossed paths for the first time, but that's kind of what I would guess it would have been. Yeah, I think so too. So yeah, Lenowski would have his jam at his house. So it was, it was all the trucks from the circuit would pull into his road and all just like fill up his whole street and everybody would come down to the down through the woods and ride the jumps and it was a modest set of jumps like real nice and fun wood chip piles and stuff like that and tons of people were having it so it was just i think it was a fun stop in between some of the big races and uh yeah it was really cool riding with all these out of towners you know like dude there was so i mean there's so many guys from all over the place. Um, and you know, all of the, all the factory teams would roll in. I mean, I remember, uh, um, Katrina Miller had her own mechanic. Matt Bottomley was there wrenching on her butt. Like, it was just ridiculous support at the jumps. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, you would know from starting in the racing scene and having a factory ride, that you need sort of a breather in between the high intensity of the races and the pressure. And that seemed to be such a thing, right? It was just low key and where the sort of, well, I guess th that was kind of before free ride, free ride. There was free ride, but the street <clears throat> aspect of mountain biking was getting going as well and, and coming into dirt jumping and then the races, that's where we sort of got together for the first time. Yeah. I mean, racing for me was always, um, a way to test myself and see how good I was against everybody else. And, um, and then, you know, that was what got me the support in the very beginning. Um, pretty fun little story is when I got on with Cannondale, it was this guy, Dave Cody, who is a graphics designer came to my school because he graduated from my high school years before. And he came there for career day and he, and, you know, graphics designer and, you know, me and my, uh, my biker buddies were all talking to him and, uh, we were like, Hey, that was, you know, you know, awesome bikes, awesome. Everything. We'll see you at, uh, Mount Snow this summer for the, for the national. And, uh, I, you know, and that was where we left it. And then I get to Mount Snow for the national and walk into registration and freaking registration's totally full. So expert slalom is full. I leave, I leave registration like, God, I'm an idiot, like talking to my buddy or whatever. And he's like, dude, just sign up for pro. Walk in there, sign up for pro. Like, see if that works. I signed up for pro. I qualified 10th uh, and beat Andrew Shandro and then just kept racing people. And then my, uh, my dude, David Cody, sees, sees what I'm up to. And he's like, dude, we got this little team starting up next year. It's going to be the head shock team which then the year after became the Soviet team um and i got on board with those guys and they weren't even a, a gravity team so much as they were just like a, a traditional uh, cross-country race team um got on with those guys got in with uh the guys at cannondale started doing testing and everything else and i was on board with those guys for 17 years from there on yeah but you missed a few steps there because I did know about this story, but I hadn't heard it like from you is just so happened that you messed up entering an expert race that you were forced to race pro. Obviously yeah. you had to be good enough because you qualified 10. So clearly the skill was there, but if it hadn't been for that, you might not have got the support for a while. 
Well, th- no, not at all, because my buddies were the Spooky Cycles guys, which you probably don't even know that name of that company. Anyway, th- these guys are out of upstate New York, so they're, you know, in my area, and they're like hardcore power to the people. Like they had BMX bottom brackets in their uh, in their dirt jump bike or whatever the, called the Metalhead, and it was a steel bike with gussets. It was just very different than Cannondale's, which were light and, you know, the welds are all um are all uh sanded down to be nice and smooth it's just in canada was so different and this and and spooky cycles was so different and when uh dave asked me to put my resume together i you know this is just uh, all the races i've done like let me write it all down and and then i sent it to the spooky guys too and i didn't get any response they probably tossed it right in the trash um, which I even know those guys and everything else, but anyway, missed the, missed the boat there and had to take the Cannondale position. So, and it ended up working out. Thank God. I think, I mean, how many out. times does that happen to you? And yeah. How many times does what? that happen Have in a career into where pro. it's like, not forced to enter pro, but like <laughs> something happens and it changes the course for everything. And you're like, wow, if that path didn't go that way that way where would i have gone you know well i mean yes always looking back at it's super interesting because you you could be so bummed and then luckily your buddy said just enter pro like what's the big deal you want to race so do you can you remember being this grom and entering pro like was there nerves or he's just you know sort of ignorance is bliss not knowing anything and just wanting to ride your bike no i knew i knew it was like it was a big deal uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, because this wasn't my first slalom race. There was a slalom series around here um, that was heavily supported by Mobile Speed Pass, which is like the toll booth company. And we were, I was winning money every weekend, and that was my summer job was was racing bikes. So I was the I was the fast guy around here. Anyway, me and Kyle Ebbett were battling like every every weekend. It was just such a such a good time. Um, and I was fast and I felt fast and, uh, I felt like if I needed to turn it up even more, I could. So it was just like, you know, when you're racing and you're feeling fast, um, yeah, slide into pro, let's do it. But the reality sets in when you're sitting in line and this is like a slalom thing, but, but the line and slalom is the first race of the day. It's just trying to get to that starting gate because everybody just funnels in all those guys are savages. There's like Miles Rockwell and Cullinan and Missy Giovi was just right there. Like just all the, just all the most iconic people in line racing to get to the start, you know, because it's not a nice clean line. It's like everyone's just funneling in. And I remember standing there, like I was standing still or going backwards in a river, you know, it's just like everybody else is getting their runs in and I'm just still like not aggressive enough to, squeeze my way to the start line <laughs> i remember my first pro race at big bear um i was sort of in front of vores and behind someone else just i mean i i was freaking out inside i was freaking out you know you yeah. qualify and it, you don't expect to be anywhere so you I qualify whatever 20th or 25th whatever it is in the downhill and then you look around who you're with you know and it's just it's quite it's kind of a pinch me moment i guess and then as you get confidence you obviously qualify even better and then you got to start believing that you can beat these guys come final um, but i i yeah that first first pro race is something else man i guess there is only one first pro race isn't there oh yeah yeah and this one was in front of my hometown in you know right there in mount snow vermont um <clears throat> And, uh, I, I just had so much support and I had nothing to lose. So I was, and I was just riding on rails anyway. So that's cool. Lose. Yeah. That you just yeah. felt you'd had nothing to lose. Like, well, I'm not meant to yeah. be in pro anyway. So if I got first round, who cares? Uh, yeah, I didn't, I, I just remember, you know, being like, well, it's time to, it's time to show them what I got and it's time to, it's time to do, uh, it's time to perform like it's time to come out of the gate strong and everything else and you know take a risk from jumping right out of the gate fast to you know to cranking all the way down through that last turn and making sure you get the most out of the differential so that your next run's a little easier that's cool man and that's so you as you said you met this guy 
at school, then you bump into him here in your pro race, and it led to your first pro contract, which would later be said Cannondale Sobe, which is technically outside industry sponsorship back then. You know, some of these teams had the big. That's a drink sponsor, right? Sobe was like a big. Yeah, drink it's not sponsor. even around anymore. No, Pepsi it's bought not. Right. Him and I think I think dissolved the company. I, uh, but anyway, Sobe back in the day had. 50 flavors like big glass bottles i don't know they they get all the 7-elevens and gas stations right they were in all that stuff yeah with like i remember carrot elixir and pina colada and there's all these like flavors that people don't even drink anymore but they were pretty popular then like green tea something and uh, you know it's just all this stuff that people don't even really drink anymore but anyway sobe came into the sport in a big, big way, um, and then they were bought out by Pepsi, and then the mood changed, and then they were off the program, and then that got dissolved. But while they were there, the people that were in it were were full gas in sponsoring people. They even they sponsored Pastrana. They ran a running race down the slalom course called like the Sobe Slammer. You like run. Halfway down the slalom course, slam Sobe, and then run the rest of the way. And I remember a guy broke his leg and <laughs> just running the the race course uh, in front of the fans as like a halftime show in the slalom or something like that. But anyway, I'm getting off on a tangent, but Sobe did a lot for um, for me in the very early days by fueling that team and uh, paying for. We had two mechanics. And these two mechanics were driving to all the races. I would hop in the car and bum rides. And we would have a trainer set up in the back of the of the truck. So you could like sneak into the back and like just spin for an hour and then get all sweaty and then, you know, get back whatever in the in shotgun and just kind of ride the rest of the way. And it was um it was pretty sick little team. Um it was just mostly women's the biggest people on the team were the women's cross country. And so was I was kind of, yeah, I was kind of on the, yeah, exactly. I was the redheaded stepchild to Lopes and Cedric on the Volvo team. So they'd be True, like, yeah, Lopes yeah, got a yeah. new bike. You, you, you get a new bike, but now it's got a Sobe paint job. And same with the downhill bikes and everything else. I I got all the bikes that Lopes. You get the same stuff as that the factory, yeah, the Lopes and Grassi era with Volvo Canada. It was one of the biggest teams to date, you know, like how professionally it was run, the money that was in there. I've seen like um, team workbooks, like it was proper, proper stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, Absolutely. They would come up with something new all the time and you were constantly testing it. So it was like the R and D to your race career was, you know, it was like half and half because I would ride, I rode that double rear shock Gemini at the time it was called. And, um, I rode that thing in races and broke different things in the races all season had like the most frustrating season on that bike. Um, but, uh, I don't know, I learned a lot or a lot of what not to do, I guess, basically. But, but Canada was never a company that shied away from taking risks. And, 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 uh, I mean, that showed with, they had quad piston brakes. They put the bearings outside of the bottom bracket shell for a while. For, so it's wider. They did, um, you know, they made the bikes look good by, by polishing the welds. That's a controversial kind of thing too. And then the lefty fork, like Jesus, when I got, when I, I first went down to Connecticut to do R and D on the lefty fork and they were like, we got a special thing for you to check out. Can't wait for you to get here, you know? And I'm like, great. So, and while I'm down there and I'm looking at this fork, I was like, you guys, the second one of these breaks, no one's ever going to buy one again. And, uh, I don't know that I, I, they're not the best fork. The, it, it's not a fork that everybody is desiring, but also never really saw one of them break. They were pretty strong, so they worked well, out. But w- w- what was your first thought? Like you, you told them this is not a good idea, but yes, did if they said we've got something new for you and you didn't know yeah. what it was, and you walk in and then you yeah. see it's half a fork, 
Yes. Well, what are you? What is going through your mind? I didn't think it was a good idea at all. I mean, I, <laughs> no, I, I, I thought it, no I thought shit. it was ugly. I thought it was ugly, and and then I and then I was just like the second one of these breaks. No one's ever gonna buy them. The other cool part is that the when I and you just kind of painted a picture, but you walk in and see the fork. I walked in and saw the fork, and I saw the prototype forks, which were bigger in dimension. They had like a downhill bazooka tube lefty fork too, like 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 oh, a that Zizek, luckily never a went si- compared to like a rock shock. Like you're just like whoa, the whole thing's like twice as big. Yeah. Yeah, that never came to market, like a big bazooka lefty fork, which was pretty crazy too. It was like the size of the Cannondale tubes itself. You know, those were all oversized. Um, but yeah, I just, uh, it didn't seem like the best idea, but um, but also it was, it ended up, it ended up working out like Cedric and Lopes raced on them. Um, and then I started shooting trick videos while riding this lefty fork so i would do like a sprocket disaster and like a bar spin but the top tube i mean the the lefty fork had this big pad on it that if you x'd it up or like you know crossed it up or whatever and it would it, like a bumper but a big bumper for the top tube and uh and anyway i'd bar bang like rewind so it's like a half a bar spin and then it whacks into the frame and then comes right back into the same hand. So you throw and catch with the same hand and then like pop off of it. I couldn't do it in the air or anything like that, but I could in like stalls. And anyway, I did a, I also did a half bar spin to no hand lander because that also like had stoppers and it kind of worked. But I remember just taking that fork and kind of running with it. Like I ran front brakes and did nose pick stuff and, and all these uh, other weird tricks. And I just took the fork and was like, well, this is what I'm riding. So I got to make it not only work, but work for me, you know? So where, where did it, all the street stuff come and, and like that transition from being on a race team, being on a factory team. And I would assume it was more a slow burner of pissing them off, doing parking lot jibs and breaking stuff. And maybe them feeling like you're not focused on racing. Where, like, can you talk me through that? period well especially the team that i was on was really focused so like i would try to bum a spot on the floor in the condo and i'd run out to race practice come back in grab something and grab some fireworks and leave and everyone's like shouldn't you chill and like put your feet up and rehydrate like you know we're at mammoth or big bear or whatever like you got to relax in between all of this so you can like save your energy. And I'm like, well, I mean, I just got here. We're in California. Like all my friends are outside. (laughs) I'm out of here. So uh, for, for me, like I really worked on making racing uh, or treating racing as a job and really trying to be serious, but I never, I never um, fully committed to being like the, the most serious racer. Um, I really tried, but uh, but when push came to shove, I was outside riding with my buddies or riding some new drainage ditch or the dirt jumps down the road. or yeah, I was just riding my bike and, and hanging with my friends always called me over, like take that time off, rest your body so that tomorrow you can be a better racer. But that's just tough for you. So it just wasn't what your personality was. Like the more you no. tried to be serious, the more you were just kept fighting it internally. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and then, and then also being serious and training my motor, trying to get my motor up and running, um, you know, more powerful, like my legs and lungs and, uh, putting more miles down on a road bike and everything else. Um, I did it and, and it worked and it, and you know, I felt benefits from it and everything else, but it just, I couldn't maintain that level of, seriousness or professionalism because i felt that the race um the field was so freaking high level that it was like everything i did to be better just kind of kept me up with the peloton never like on the front like i'd get out there and and you know do all right at slums and stuff like that and then i'd 
I'd come down through the finish line of a, of a, of a downhill race, like feeling really good. And it would be in like twenties or thirties. And I'm just like, Phew. like the people that the guys that consistently can land on the podium are just uh, uh, untouchable in my opinion. And, and it's attractive to win races and you in, and, and race and everything else. But when your other teammates are like Cedric and, and lopes and you're like, fuck, I'm never going to fucking be like, I'm never going to beat these guys. These guys are insane. Um, you know, on so many levels, but the one thing that I do is, you know, I jump off the steps and over the, this and down the hill and off the roof or we'll do a trick on the slalom course or something like that. And I was getting more praise or more, recognition for shooting videos so i the very first video i shot for was matt collins video it was like masters of reality i think it was called and that was matt collins was the one that shot with vorties all the time yes they lived and in then, santa Bar. i feel like he was from santa barbara or maybe that's where i met him yeah yeah and he's still around he still shoots stuff for for vorties and stuff like that um and then i got on board real quick with don hampton from dh productions and shot in central park in new york city and then <clears throat> went to lars's dirt jumps and just you know started a big relationship with uh with don hampton he taught me how to edit and then i produced you know countless videos with him and then I even did a couple of my own killing time counterparts and bang bang so true yes was man those fun, yeah. you saying those were produced by you as well yeah like yeah. you put together what the budget and this filming the schedule and like wrapped it up true killing well, the, time yeah the first one yeah killing time the first one was just all my footage boom like i'm going to edit it the way i want i'm going to put all the songs in that i want and video action sports did the worldwide distribution and we had them um, uh everything was out on dvd and that was the time too when you could make an honest um decision of doing vhs and dvd or just straight dvd like you had an option <laughs> so i just yeah. always went straight straight dvd so i never unfortunately i never had a vhs that would have been cool but it was a whole nother uh level of um i guess to print all those costs a little bit more if you're going to go both ways i don't remember exactly how it all went but dvds were fun you made about two dollars a video um two dollars for a twenty dollar video but um it worked out and it was cool to get sponsorship for i got sponsorship for the second and the third video um the counterparts was one where i could hit up claw and get like a big melt tape of all his best shit like give me that here's my tape of all my best shit for his video run for your life and he like so all my savage moments like i i would we just trip foot trade footage like ah, i had crazy and you, and, stuff and you say you were like, editing it yourself you physically were editing it back then as well oh yeah 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 don hampton helped me because we did the first two um we did the first two chain reactions and then for the third one, I slid in the editor seat and edited my section and a couple other guys' sections. Oh, wow. And um, Yeah, I and literally didn't even know that. to get me started. That's a lot yeah, of work, and after man. The, like, people don't yeah. see it. They just think you're in these movies, but they didn't see the groundwork behind the scenes. Yeah, and producing those three DVDs, like Soup to Nuts, is a lot of work. And... Uh, Counterparts was my favorite one because that was the one where I actually intentionally tried and I intentionally won, you know, like I was like, Killing Time was, it is what it is. And it came out and it was great. Awesome video. Everybody liked it. And then Counterparts, I really tried and it really worked out. And then Bang Bang, I really tried, but I crashed, broke my back and pff, salvaged the video and my filmer stayed out in Europe for that Kashki series with Cam McCall and followed him around. And, and it kind of was like a split story between me and Cam McCall. Um, it was supposed to be, 
the name of the video was supposed to be this is free ride and it was going to be a party video through europe doing all the cash key events and uh and making money and, and just having a blast but i ended up crashing in practice on the first event and busting my back up and that was the end of my uh slope style career for sure and that was the end of my video this is free ride and then it turned into bang bang which was kind of just like a polar opposite like a split down the middle like here's here's where the here's what happens when two paths go two different ways you know one's the injury injury and one's you know going all the way to the finish line and how many years were there of doing the filming and slope style and these events until the injury and after leaving like, of racing? Like how many years are there before that, that big injury yet? Yeah. So the timeline is I graduated high school in 97 and I got on with Cannondale in 98 and I rode pro uh, from 98 to 2003 was my last year and 2004 was the first year. And then I left uh, my team, my mechanic, kept Cannondale as a frame sponsor and then picked all of my other sponsors a la carte and then left racing in 03 for free ride in 04. So 04, I was done racing and uh, I was already in bed with Red Bull and New World Disorder. So I was like, I'll, I'll do this and this will, this will be what I'll, what I'll do instead of, you know, instead of racing. And, and the crash again, what year was the cash guy where, where you broke your back? Yeah, that was 2007. So that's only three years of yeah, full time. Four, four years. Yeah. Slope style and, and doing well then, yeah, it was slope style, but it was quite, some of them were quite street orientated as well, which was really your forte. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, shit, that's quite crazy and early on for such yeah. a horrific crash that, like you say, it created these two paths that could have been this one and you were forced down another one. I didn't think it was that short of a space. Obviously, you had quite yeah. a few years as a pro and racer and, and doing both and people knew your name, which obviously helped. That's what it was. That's yeah. what it was. It was that's I was why doing it felt both longer. racing and... And, film and video and parts and all sorts, yeah. 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 So once 2000, so in 2006, I won the, I, or I won the, um, in 05, I won the Red Bull bike battle. In 2006, I won the Red Bull district ride. And, um, and that was the biggest contest at the time, the biggest prize purse, the most amount of people watching an event. There was like 40,000 people in town. Um, so that was my peak pinnacle um of 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 competition um that those days of competing with those guys because there's probably like let's say a dozen guys that all went to these contests had to be one of the coolest eras ever because we're all friends we're all traveling we're all trying to get second behind Darren Bearclaw and Darren Bearclaw is always taking his, some of his prize person, bringing it to the bar after. And it was just fun. Like it was just so fun. You know, Cam McCall and Zinc were like the Groms tagging along and uh, yeah, Bearclaw, Randy Spangler and um, just just fucking all these super sick dudes um, that uh, that shaped the sport um, and watching that go down, like watching Bear Claw 3, that road gap at Crankworks for the first time. And we're just like, dude, he might, he might be able to do it, but if he crashes, he's dead. You know, it was just like one of those high consequence. That thing was moves, big, but he, true. I was there. That was in 04, yeah. maybe. Yeah, that sounds about right. Some four oh five. Yeah, you forget how gnarly it was. Obviously, we all age on, and you age out of your role in the industry or competing. And 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 I'm not going to gloss over your injury because yours obviously, you know, you transitioned way earlier because of an injury. 
But Bearclaw, like you forget that he was an icon of freeride or what he pushed. You know, now you see him like, okay, you're judging now and you, you're a gnarly guy. But you forget. Um, and it's good to talk about shit going back there that he was quite unstoppable at some of these comps. Oh, yeah. And Timo Pritzel, like the German, like he wasn't afraid to like gap shit or flip anything. And he was he was one of the guys, too, that like he'd show up to an event and, and flip something uh, early on and uh, and just kind of open your eyes to what people are comfortable with, you know, with um, with tricks and risk and. And then, of course, every year it just keeps going up and up. And before you know it, you're like, sky's the limit. I mean, it really is. Um, but yeah, when I don't know where I'm going with that, but uh, it was a fun ride to watch guys like like Zinc or McCall kind of come up too. you know. Um, traveling with Jordy Lunn, he was, he was out there at a lot of them, like uh, – Thomas Vanderham did slope style then and, and Richie Schley, like Wade Simmons, like these guys were all doing it. They're yeah. all at the top. Yeah. No, it was a, it was a rock star period of the sport as well. So was Bearclaw one of the first to sort of do the unwritten 10% of prize money needs to go on the bar tab kind of thing? Was yeah. he kind of the, yeah. the founder really of was. that? Which I'm I mean, into. So. I think it's cool. I think that brings everyone together, even though you're competing against each other. It does because, um, you know, there's going to be that guy like Darren that, um, that, you know, it feels un, un, like it's n not balanced, like Darren's always coming to it. But then every other guy th that would go out and compete, I mean, dude, if you didn't win, I mean, you were, you'd win such a small prize, you know, you'd win such a small amount of money already anyway. And then if you got third, it was way less. I mean, traveling to Europe and leaving with 600 euros sounds great, but it costs 1200 euros just to get there. Like it's doesn't, it doesn't really work out. And you really, really realize that all these guys would do all of this for free regardless of sponsors and everything else, because it's not a money grab. It's, it's, it's a personal, um, it's a personal goal to push yourself and try to better yourself against all these other guys. It's definitely not a financial move where you're like, Hey, a couple more of these and I'll be set for life. Like that's not it at all. So, um, yeah. So I think it always left like a pure spot in my heart doing these competitions because it everybody was really f bros and um and then you know it, and then and then you did your run and then everybody partied together at the end so it, you know it was uh yeah, it was just really neat i even felt like in racing there's you know it's a little divided um there's like an upper echelon, like serious racers. And then there's kind of like a, you know, the guys that aren't maybe the top 10 and behind or something like that. I don't know. I just always thought there was a split and a divide, but, and maybe because I was really part of the free ride club, like one of the center guys in the free ride club, I just felt like it was very inclusive, but that's just my position there. Yeah, I think that's kind of quite interesting. There's obviously more races, and I think there is sometimes a divide even now. You know, there's guys that can win races, and there's a lot more of them now and be on the podium, and maybe the guys that were super serious and not at the bar, and then you had a few guys that would win races and be at the bar. Um, oh, yeah. But you've got to you got to earn those guys' respect to be in that clique, you know, and I, and, and I think in freeride there's less guys, and you've got everyone's – I'm not saying the top racers don't respect everyone else or someone that's not doing as well, but in free ride, like you're doing the same thing. You're the one doing a crazy, maybe nose tap 360 that someone else go, well, that's really impressive. I can't really do that. And then Timo's doing the flip over something where you're like, well, I'm not touching that trick. So I respect it. Does that make sense? Mm, yeah. And you're all like, yeah, I mean, all races can relate to each other on pressure and getting down the track, but something is quite unique with a free ride free ride crew i would say and looking back at it i mean 
was there pressure to up your game and keep uh, raising the bar on the risk level? Um, for sure. Uh, in the competition side, yes. There's, I mean, there's pressure at every event because every event um, tries to outdo the event before it. In, in, and what I mean by that is, you know, what's special about this event? Well, it's bigger. Like that's, and I always felt like that. So we'd have, we'd show up and be, I like I'd show up on a hardtail and be like, I can't jump half of this on a hardtail. I should have been on a full suspension bike with a full face helmet, but I did the last contest on a hardtail and, and won it. Like I, you just never knew what to expect. Um, and then also I didn't, I wasn't that, I didn't feel that great on Cannondale's suspension bikes because they were pretty linear in the way that they were great for pedaling and nice and supple. But when it comes to hitting the ramp and popping, it was, you know, they were like single pivots, kind of like that orange bike that you were on, like nice and simple. But then when you're hitting jumps and steeper ramps, like it really moved a lot. And I don't know. What, who was your crew that you came over? Because I remember, you know, you were on the global team. Who is it? Who is your crew that you came to the States with? Well, my crew was just myself. Luckily, Sven and Anka took me under their wing. But I but yeah. I got to know the Aussies. Um, so like yeah. Rennie, Sam Hill, Atkinson and Graves, they took me under their wing. Yeah. For good or for Dude, worse. Bu- um, bunch of I misfits got, right there. I got my education of America and internationally by those guys um <laughs> we would all come to to those those jumps so yeah man i hear i mean when you speak of those years those are my favorite years for sure the first yeah. year or two and renting a cabin in big bear and probably yeah. should be out training but we were just dirt jumping and keeping bike fit you know and it, it was like simpler times really before it got so serious very much simpler times and i remember that crew of guys so it was like the cranked team or the global team or whatever all those fuckers were so fast like i remember the first time i saw mick hanna he you know had no pads on and fucking scolded everybody in the downhill race with no pads and you're and and this was at a time where like everyone was wearing like some serious battle gear you know and he didn't even have knee pads on and then i remember kavark scolding everybody and coming down at the end and just looking like he just like he just he almost had like the anger, like he just punched somebody in the face, but he had the breathing, like he just punched somebody in the face. Like he was a little like, <sighs> but he wasn't breathing heavy. Like he just pedaled down the mountain at elevation. Like I get to the bottom and I'm like coughing and like trying to catch my breath. And I'm like, my eyes are water and I'm like dying. And he crushed everybody at big bear one year by like six seconds or something. And I was like, looking for the tape hanging off of his bike. I'm like, how did he beat everybody? He's not even really breathing that hard. And anyway, and then Rennie, like he was a machine, dude. Um, dude, was it, you think, I mean, those, all those guys you just mentioned, but wasn't Rennie one of the most talented guys on a bike? Because he could do the parking yeah. lot stuff and he could go win a downhill and it was, yeah. brew, you know, it wasn't always the, like, it wasn't always finesse. No. But, um, dude, he was so talented. I mean, they all were. Yeah, he had a lot of strength and power, and um, yeah, he seemed like he was stronger than the bike. Like the bike will break, but Rennie will probably won't. I did <laughs> yeah. a big trip. I did a big trip to Australia with Rennie um, and a couple of other guys, and we did a lot of like long distance, like towing in on a moto and hitting hitting moto ramps and because we were in the middle of i don't know we were just trying to get footage in the middle of australia which is the nullabore which means that there's nothing there um so we went and rode these like opal mines and uh and everybody got a couple shots in new world disorder and um but this trip was more than that it was three weeks driving across country in a bus with grant allen you know that remember that guy think so grant allen rode for kona and he was a he was a short little dirty not grant fielder no grant Grant allen Allen. 
Yeah. Okay, he's, he's, an, he's an Aussie. Ah, uh, okay. okay, uh, okay. Him and Dave Watson and Rennie. Uh, God, there was, I feel like there's one other guy on that trip, but it was a Red, Red Bull trip. Um, and we drove from Perth to Adelaide from like West Coast to East Coast um, in three weeks. So we were out in the middle of, you know, before you have cell phones and everything else, so you're just like out there. Like, dude, and there's so many things in the middle of Australia that are like dangerous. There, there was a Gila monster. One morning we woke up. Do you know what a Gila monster is? No, like a- I'm literally <laughs> have no idea, but I'm going to have it's- to research it. <laughs> It's a, it's a lizard that's, you know, pretty like a, an iguana or something, but it's a little bit more robust, like a little thicker. And then its mouth is even bigger and it's black with a little yellow on it or purple, I should say. It's, it's dark with like some light spots on it. And uh, this guy will bite you and he's poisonous and he can kill you. Uh, but if you find one in the morning before the sun really comes up and this guy warms up, He's kind of paralyzed because he's cold all night. So it was just stuff like that. And and the the photographer I was with is an Aussie dude, this guy, Matt something. Um, and he was just like, oh, mate, look at this, like a Gila monster. God, we could pick him up. He can't even move. This guy could kill you and he can't even touch you right now. And I'm like holding it. Anyway, we had a blast. Uh, it's just there's so many things that you see on the road especially when you're getting up early and you're getting out there in the, in the bush early and then you're leaving late and, you know, and you're just exploring some of the coolest nooks on, on earth. And, uh, yeah. So I, again, I don't know where I was going with that too, but no, yeah, but keep, I'm, keep going wherever. Cause like if you, it's good to look back. I mean, I always say, you know, yeah. I've traveled the world. Yes, I'm not always a tourist in a tourist place, but I'm on someone else's dime, often paying for it. Yes, I'm working or we're doing a trip and you got to get the footage. But in between, you're getting to see all these crazy places you probably would never go as a tourist often, right? You wouldn't book the holiday yeah. to go see all the Gilo monster or whatever. Like, it just wouldn't happen. Like, no. There's the, some of the shit you get up to. And the memories you sort of form in this industry are hilarious. And it's neat too, like the quests that you go on, because you're not necessarily going to Peru to go to Machu Picchu, you're, which, which everybody else goes on, which is like the plane to the bus, to the train, to the state park, to the, to the line, and then you're done with Machu Picchu. Like you just, you did the road that's most traveled in that area. When you're filming or on a bike trip, no one goes to any of these spots that you go to. And then you flow through all of these zones um, in a way that is beautifully exciting and pure and quiet, but fast pace. Um, And you get to soak up so much more and be a part of so much more doing it on two wheels than you would if you, you know, kind of showed up with the tourist guide and try to hit all the hot spots. Um, and then, and then the other side to it is the bike world itself is so freaking cool that if you're a biker and he's a biker and you're like, wait, you came from South Africa to ride here, dude, let me show you all this other stuff. Like, and then you're, you're in the group and then they're like, dude, you come, come to a barbecue at our house after, you know, my buddy's got to see this or or hear this, or you got to, you got to try this bike or you got to try my pump track in the backyard, whatever it is. Um, You know, it's very inclusive when you're a higher level rider or you're just somebody that comes from further away, like the bike world or the bike community is a good bunch of, bunch of people. It opens up doors. You're right. Obviously if you're a named rider or high level they're going to want to look after you. But I remember when I went to Iran, it wasn't because of my name. You know, it definitely was not because of that. These were just guys wanted to show off their country or their friend was the guide for the bikers and he rode. Um, And it was amazing to get invited. Like you say, well, then come and come and have breakfast with us and they would make a local dish, which you're not having as a tourist. 
you're definitely not, and you're not having it from someone so kind to bring you into their home, you know. And I was thinking when you transitioned, you went on a lot of these adventure trips, and you just mentioned Peru. Like you've seen some pretty impressive places that I don't know. I wonder you might not have seen them if you just went down the competition route, you know. For sure. Um, doing that, for, doing the free ride thing was cool. So, in during the height of that with uh, with free ride entertainment and neural disorder, it was like, all right, boys, you killed it last year and you just rode New York City. Where are we going this year? And it was like, Europe? And they're like, yeah, where? Like Amsterdam? Where else? Uh, Barcelona? Maybe Dusseldorf, Germany? All right, cool. That's that's your trip. Take Ian Highlands and and take Rob the filmer. Like take these guys and you know come back with the goods. And we would go bouncing around through countries in Europe. We'd go, yeah, South America. Or I went to Turkey a couple times and rode over there in some just really insane spots that, um, yeah, that wouldn't have had a world-class race or a world-class event because of their lack of infrastructure, but makes you get out there and see the world and see how other people live and see how other people ride, you know, and show up and, um, and experience it. And it gives you an awesome perspective of your life when you go home, um, and you know your kitchen floor is dirty and you got a sink full of dishes and you're like that's nothing because these guys live in a dirt floor and they don't have a sink with dishes <laughs> and you're like so i guess i'm not doing too bad um as i i always like that 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 part of of travel is to um is to see how other people lived you know i always thought that that was really freaking cool especially when you go to a place like like Peru and, and some of these people live at 14,000 feet and um, I'm, wa I'm watching a kid walking around outside barefoot, um, high elevation with wind blisters on their cheeks. And I'm like, that little girl's the same age as my little girl. And if she had a blister on her cheek, she'd have aquaphor on her cheek. We'd be all like making sure her cheeks are okay. Like it's just, it's just so different. And this is like, you know, a different world where people just people just grow up a little bit more rugged maybe i don't know what it is but seeing you know a mom with a huge cancerous tumor on her chest and she's got a kid and you're just like oh my god like these are all people that you know aren't long for the world and they're all doing their best and then we can go back home and, you know, have proper medical care and, and insurance. And, and if you have a tumor somewhere, like that's getting checked out and getting removed and we'll, we'll have a biopsy on it and find out what's going on. And, you know, then you go to other places in the world and it's just, you just play whatever card you, you're dealt. Um, so anyway, it's eye opening and it makes you a better person to see more of that and, the biking world, um, you know, gave me those opportunities. Um, and I'll definitely never, uh, never forget it because I, I, I remember, you know, being on most of the trips I was always on, I would, you know, wake up in the morning and go, man, I can't believe I'm out here, man. I can't believe I got this opportunity. I, I always felt grateful for being places and, you know, maybe not always, but I, I really, I really did smell the roses as much as I could. Yeah, that's awesome to hear. And, and um, it's so fascinating, like two wheels. I mean, were there places that you went where people didn't even know what a bicycle was? Because I feel as a mode of transport, it's an accepted tool, right? Whereas if you yeah. went somewhere else trying to show them another sport, and I'm not going to say which one, you know, there's some popular sports, like soccer is the most popular sport in the world, right? So, mm -hmm. yes, you most kids might know what a soccer ball is, but maybe not. But a bicycle, they've often seen it or understood like it's a mode of transport. But it's quite fascinating when they see you ride it down things that it shouldn't be ridden down. That, oh, that to me is yeah. so funny. 
Oh yeah. And I mean, South America is the best kind of example for that is like, you'd go somewhere and you ride. I was just in Bolivia and riding down through uh, the streets of La Paz and you're like banging down these steep steps and every, and these are the stairs to people's homes that they, you know, full communities will hike up and down just to get to their houses. And, uh, if this was in the States, it would be very much frowned upon, but down there they're like, Whoa, these gringos are crazy. Like they don't think it's a bad thing. They just think that you're crazy and they watch it and they go, well, that was wild. And then they keep going along on their way. So I think that's kind of like the funnest part is, well, it's one of the funnier parts that people down there at least seem to have less possessiveness of the stairs that go to their house and more of, uh, let me see what these guys are doing and get out of their way. And what the, what's, what are those guys doing? And then they're back on their way again. So I think it's just fun, uh, to see different, um, different people react to different things in different areas. It's just a different world and people are all, you know, inherently the same, but very different in, in, in the way that they take in their life. Uh, I love South America, man. I've spent yeah, a lot of time down there and, and I really connect awesome. with that vibe. Yeah. And you think it's less materialistic as well? I mean, when you have less, there's less to worry about and maybe makes you worry about the right things and not, things that actually don't matter in the long run, you know, we're so sort of brainwashed uh, in the Western world on, on certain aspects. Well, we have the most, I mean, the biggest opportunities, right? So what you, of course you want to take them and an opportunity to um, do a podcast with you and get some new headphones with this speaker thing, you know, um, I, I don't know. It's just, that's how it is around here and down there. It's a lot more simple and, uh, streamlined, but I do believe with, you know, more money becomes more whatever wants or needs or more problems or however that saying goes, but yeah, more, uh, more money, more problems. Wasn't it? Big? Yeah. I mean, I'll, I guess I respect if it wasn't, maybe it was Tupac. It's <laughs> I not don't me. know. It's not me. No, it's, <laughs> as a biker you're never going to have more money more problems <laughs> no you have more free stuff which creates more clutter and problems <laughs> <laughs> yeah as your garage still full of tires or what? what what do you have the most of the most like uh, seat just, posts or something like i don't know gear every year you i'm spoiled get new gear, gear yeah. so then i can yeah. donate it to the charity or my mates uh, yeah yeah gear yeah tires definitely. bikes well like you say that you hang on every year and then you just don't use it and then you get the new ones i don't know yeah mine would be tires tires yeah because you always access tires yeah you yeah i got i got a fair share because you get you know if you're spoiled yeah. you get a few few bikes a year and then those need tires and you think you're going to wear them out but because you have a few bikes you don't wear out all the tires and all the bikes <laughs> yeah and uh we, we just we're just showing how spoiled we are i guess yeah i know but that's a currency too I, I mean dude i was with red bull for 19 years so i was able to like tip the the garbage man like a case of red bull here you go like you know i'd have a case of red bull in my truck if i was driving 100 miles down the road because who knows what i'm going to need for whatever and then i'd pull into the parking lot at at the ski resort and there's no parking and i'm like dude can you fit me in and plus i don't have any space for this i got a whole case of red bull like can yeah you, <laughs> can you take this you know and people are like what what take the whole thing that's like 50 bucks or 100 bucks or whatever red what whatever and uh yeah I'll, I'll find you a spot like i don't know it was just such a currency that everybody no, fair, no 100 percent yeah yeah, you, you know, you're right. You don't, you ain't getting super, super rich from this bike industry. You get a hell of a lot of free stuff if you're able to perform well on a bike. That's for sure. Dude, yeah. you would have got away from some serious speeding fines in South Africa. You could, that Red Bull energy drink down here, trail building as yeah. well. I can get us some trails built on, on, on Red Bull. That stuff's some serious currency. Dude, 
For real? All right, let's go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I still got a, I still got a connection. I'm not getting cases every month anymore, but dude, not after they point, listen to this, they're not. <laughs> no, I'm, 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 I'm sponsorless. I, no one holds uh, any weight over me anymore, which is good and bad, I guess. Um, <laughs> is any of it? But, is some of it freeing? Yeah. Well, so. Yes, it is, especially with Red Bull. Red Bull's a heavy helmet to ride around with, you know? Mm. Um, and uh, and I got a lot more used to it, but after I busted my back and everything else and I felt as though I didn't quite have my superpower of I can do anything on a bike or I can I can be faster than the guy next to me if I need to. If I need to turn it up, I can turn it up. Um, after I broke my back in 07, all that went out the window and I was more of a, of, of a superhero without their superpowers, but I still had the cape and the, the outfit and everything else and the muscles and I, I had everything, but I just did not have that edge that gave me more than everybody else or the next guy. Um, Anyway, what was I saying for – oh, with Red Bull. Oh, well, and, now not having sponsors. But but on that point, oh, yeah. so so this injury of yours, like you – I've read a bunch about it and looked at some interviews, and I guess we were at different paths, and I was chasing the racing dream still, and we weren't always crossing paths, uh, for lack mm -hmm. of a better term. So I don't think I understood the effect it had on you and, and maybe having to reinvent yourself. And like you said, feel like you didn't have a superpower. What, what was it like dealing with that injury and understanding what you could do on a bike and couldn't and thus having to make a career? Uh, so in a I'll way? take you a year before that. I had just won the district ride, won the most money, and now I got invited by Tarek Rizzoli, who's like the gatekeeper for all the events in Europe. And he's like, we're doing this five stop, five country, five different free ride discipline tour through Europe next year. We're taking 10 guys and you're one of the 10 guys. And it's like Bear Claw and Zinc and Straight and McCall. And, you know, I, it was just, it was a, a sick group of, of riders. And I was in there and it was like, great, we're all going to compete and go to from country to country five weeks in a row for this uh for this for nissan who's paying for the entire event um and i get to the first one in newcastle england and was riding you know great and getting my run kind of finalized and it was my last time doing the run before qualifying and they had this like wooden step up onto a platform and then it turned and then a two by four that just goes, let's say, 25, 30 feet long. So it's pretty freaking long. And, uh, and, and then there's hay, hay bales underneath it. And it was about an eight foot drop. So it was, it was high enough to feel pretty scary. Um, and, uh, and people were screwing up. But when they screwed up, they like hit their brakes, stopped because they're out of balance, and then hopped over the top tube and jumped all the way down and landed on the hay bales. Um, so this last one I had hopped up and I was riding across it and I was just kind of leaning over my bars to get down to the very end of it. And my back tire slipped off and I kind of cased the side of it and the side of the structure that broke a little bit too. And some of the boards came off and I came backwards off the side of it and I fell into a wall. So I, I kind of like fell and I, and I, and I'm, I hit the wall and then I hit the ground in a sit, sitted position. So I was like, boom, boom. So I was straight up and down, uh, which gave me a burst fracture of my L1 vertebrae. And it's like smashing a donut on a table. The vertebrae broke, like crumbled all the way around, but it didn't shear and ding my spinal cord. It, uh, it just, the whole thing compacted and, and cracked all the way around. So when it did that, it kind of pinched my spinal cord, but it didn't, it didn't shear it. Um, so I hit the ground thinking, well, 
thinking of how bad this injury was going to be as I was falling and going, oh, fuck, I'm like landing right on my ass. I'm going to break my pelvis and like all this stuff. And then I hit the ground like a sack of potatoes. My um, Everything from my waist down was completely shut off. I was holding my the weight off of my back with my hands. So now my hands are on the ground, just, just holding weight off of my spine. My back's on fire and my legs don't move at all. And as an athlete, you already know what just happened. And I was just yelling like it, maybe in disbelief, like I can't feel my legs, like, like, like it's like somebody could help me or something like that. Like I fell in the water, help me out. Like it, it was, it was like that, but no one can do anything for you. Um, the paramedics came over, put me on a backboard and strapped me all down, got me in the ambulance, camel call jumped in the ambulance with me and my legs started to come back once I got to the hospital. So they were probably off for 15 minutes or 20 minutes maybe or something like that. Long enough that, you know, everybody around at the event and everything else all just watched their buddy get paralyzed. So that was a, ooh, that was a rough one for everybody. Uh, and then my legs came back once I got to the hospital, but I was strapped down. So I was just doing like circles with my ankles. Um, and, uh, then I was flat on a bed for 10 days and then I got the rods in my back, which, uh, which I brought out here cause I knew we were talking about it. So, so this is what they put in my back. Wow. So if you're listening right. and not watching, what's that? Two inches, those screws? Yeah, they're, yeah. they're like as, as long as my pinky or whatever. Yeah, that's... They're, and they're, 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 they're big enough them. that... They're big enough when you screw this into your spine, you feel it. And, uh, and this was the cage. This was in the... Um, bottom of the, your spine yeah. yeah the one above it and below it were fused uh -huh. and then the one in the middle was right here and um and they take bone off of your hip and pack it all around the busted up l1 and then they put those screws in and mount it all up and then they sew you all back up and uh and then you're off and running i guess but i was in england for like three weeks straight getting that all taken care of um and then until I flew back home, um, I, Nissan bought me a flight in business class on Virgin Atlantic. So I was like, I had my own like lay down bed. I could be like perfectly flat. <clears throat> um, I was really fragile though, but for 10 days I had an unstable spine where I laid flat on my back with no pillow staring at the ceiling for the whole time um, in a different country that has a different medical um system so in the u.s when i broke my femur i had my own hotel room and i was able to call down and get a milkshake uh, if i wanted to or whatever and in england you're in a room with a dozen other people and everybody has like cloth dividers and you get to hear when somebody's waking up in pain when somebody's coughing when somebody's moaning when somebody's crapping like all it's just and then you know 10 days later i'm the one moaning and screaming after my surgery and it's just uh it's it's a it was the biggest slap in the face that i've ever taken of you know just kind of wow this is uh this is all fun and games until you know you beat yourself up this bad and for a while i was getting awesome getting hurt getting better getting awesome getting hurt getting better and it was like a, i broke uh my sternum and ribs and my elbow and my foot and um and then my femur and then my back and i'm paralyzed and i'm like oh my god like i'm i'm like killing myself here um so it was such a sobering time for me that when i got home um i my wife and I, we decided to have a kid. Like it was always something we've been talking about. But then when I got home, I was like, let's do it. Let's have a kid. Like, let's do this. And she got pregnant right away. And, um, and then, you know, we had a, we had a baby girl a year later. Like it was, 
it was just a big time for me in my life uh, because I had been riding such a high with little consequence, like, you know, some busted bones and stuff like that. But when this came around, it was really a big one for me. And we ended up um, changing, changing the whole game. So I went from, I went, I took 2008 off. I didn't have a video part for neural disorder nine and then neural disorder 10, I came back with a video part and then after that, I mostly rode traditional mountain bikes, doing adventure travel or urban downhill or want some one-off stunt, like an open loop or something like that. But uh, my slope style days were done after that, like competing and everything else. Uh, wasn't going to any more events. And what happened was I sort of, now I had really built my name in racing and in free ride, had this injury. So now I've got a story and now I'm going into another phase of my career, which puts me on a tr more traditional mountain bike, which actually gives me a little bit more value with the companies that supported me. Cause now I'm actually riding a real mountain bike and not like some prototype race bike or a dirt jump bike that doesn't, you know, sell a ton, a ton of units, but still, uh, still a cool thing to have. I had six years of a pro model bike with, with Cannondale. So that was always awesome. But, um, but being able to ride a more traditional mountain bike gave me a little bit more value in the industry right then and there. And I was riding, I was going all over the world for Cannondale promoting their bikes and promoting everything that they were doing. Um, and it was, it was like, I didn't miss a step. I just changed my trajectory again from being a pro racer and having all that support, like a, like a mechanic to leaving all of that and then picking up my sponsors a la carte and going to free ride to then like sort of taking like rolling it back in the free ride world and riding more of a traditional bike and not doing the tricks that I earlier became more known for. Like, what so was it, was it mentally like for you? Like mentally now looking back, are you kind of had to not do slope style, not do the things you kind of had passion for that took you away from racing is, yeah. You know, like, like, do you think you sort of just, like we all do, just jump to the next thing and commit to that and you don't quite always deal with some of the trauma emotionally of all that stuff? So the head game to all of that was when I broke my back, I, I lost my superpower. I was no longer better, in my opinion, than everyone. Like, I, I could be like, yeah, well, if... You know, you put me on the right course on the right day. Who knows? I, I could probably win. Like, um, I no longer felt like that. I no longer felt like I had a, like I was strong enough to take a hit. Like, I can roll with the punches. I'll break my femur. I'll break my ribs, whatever. And I'll heal up. I'll be better. I'll be, you know, what is this? Six weeks, eight weeks? Like, you know. I'll be, I'll be fine in no time. And this was really like, I was, I was down and out for six months before I was like just walking around and, um, and trying to get back. And then it was about a year before I really could ride my bike again. But when I rode my bike again, it's, uh, like bunny hopping onto a picking table was like, I don't think this is happening. Like, and I used to nose bonk over a picnic table, like, mm, like there goes my superpower right now. Like most mountain bikers can case, not most only, there's only a few mountain bikers that can case their way up onto a picnic table. And now I'm casing my way up onto a picnic table. Like I used to float over these things. So it was, it was a real, it was really frustrating because my body didn't perform as well as 
my my brain knew how to do it all, but my body worked different. And now, now that I'm 45, you know, I'm fully comfortable in that spot. But at 30, I was like, I can still do that. I can still do that. And, and, and riding with those rods in my back, man, it was just, it was killing me. It was a lot of, it was a lot of pain. Um, and trying to figure out how to ride with that pain, trying to uh, like pop my back or massage my back in a way that it would take relief off so that I could continue riding. Um, it was just really, a, it was, it was very different. Um, I've got nerve damage in one of my calves. So one of my, my left calf is the soleus muscles like shut off. I can do like two or three single leg calf raises and then the muscles cooked and i'm telling you i can do two or three like i i haven't done four since before i broke my back so it's just it's just it's a nerve thing and that's why guys like paul bass or whatever else those guys are such so inspirational because nerves are like an extension cord. It's either plugged in or not. And if it's not plugged in, you can't, well, just use the saw a little bit. Like it just doesn't work. So, um, he must've had a little, whatever, a little bit was still plugged in. He worked the shit out of it and got himself back up and running and moving and, and now riding and jumping and whatever else Paul does. So, and walking more importantly and functioning like a, you know, an upright human. So he is, uh, yeah, guys like that are just such an inspiration to me. And, but, but when you're in that spot, I mean, you're, it's your number one, everything is to try to get, get yourself back to a normal life again. Um, so I did get myself back to a normal life. Uh, it's just a lot of things changed and mentally, um, I probably became more of a bitter guy sooner because of the lack of superpower that I, I, uh, I continued with. Like, I just, I just wasn't ever the, I wasn't ever the same. I still did spectacular stuff. I still put in a good neural disorder, uh, segi for, for number 10, um, and shot some really incredible stuff and I've gone and done some incredible stuff, but didn't, didn't have that superpower. I lost it that day when I broke my back. Yeah, man. Thanks for sharing that. that I mean, it just, it's so it's inspirational as well as tough because I think the ego is part of it as well, right? We're all just think we're invincible and, and you were given quite a rude awakening. Some people have a slower downfall and the career starts ending and you start getting beat more and you maybe have time to go, okay, well, I'm not going to do these crazy things as, as much anymore. And yours was a harsh sort of unfair slap in the face, as you said. Yeah. So what it did though, is now it turned me more into a GoPro athlete. So GoPro had just given me a camera and I had a GoPro on my head when I crashed. It didn't, it wasn't running, but, uh, it was a first generation one that had AAA batteries in it and it didn't have a wide angle lens. Um, so I was GoPro's first mountain bike athlete in 07. I met those guys at, uh, at, at, uh, Sea Otter and they were in a 10 by 10 GoPro tent and, uh, and then that com- that company just took off from there. But what it also did was it had me lean into technology and harnessing like technology over tricks. Like I was like, all right, now how can I shoot this different? How can I bring the viewer along with me? How can I, when I do these video projects, I'll mount GoPros on my bike so that you can see the drivetrain or so that you can see the down tube logo. And then I'll give the footage to the producer or to the filmer or whoever's managing the content. And now they have all these shots that have like nice, clean locked off shots of like the frame, like where you can actually read Cannondale or the, 
or my gear or my gloves or or me my face i can put the camera right here looking back at my face so now the whole time you're riding you can like they were able to use that so i was i was learning the tricks of the trade and i was giving these companies that were putting together content real assets like that would work with my sponsors um, and keep the value with with me as I was chugging along. So I was able to direct the shots, the GoPro shots that I shot and feed those to uh, to the different teams that were doing pieces with me. So I became one of the guys that were like a really easy guy to work with. This guy will, you know, not only get it done, but add more value to it with the stuff that he brings uh, to the table, like his expertise. So I did feel like I was figuring out the industry more. Um, It was just my riding was plateauing instead of like a limitless ceiling, you know. I mean, that's definitely going to happen at some stage. It just was forced to happen earlier to you. Now, you know, you're always going to age out of slope style, um, whether it's an injury or not, you know, and age out of competing. And then there's an ambassador thing. So I can, I I relate on some things, you know, I'm also after racing it to add value and reinvent myself. And super interesting to hear what, what you're doing. But it seemed like you said there was still a silver lining, like you were forced to then, get into the GoPro stuff more or the, you know, the adventure riding more um, because of an injury, you know? Yeah. And I mean, it's just, you just keep looking at your strengths and how to apply them to your life. And so that you can be the most impactful person for yourself and add the most value to your sponsors and keep chugging forward. Um, the sponsorship game was always a fun one um, until it wasn't. And I, you know, Lenowski and I would joke all the time and we would talk numbers and he'd be like, yeah, I just lost two sponsors, but I just picked up two sponsors or I just picked up one, but they're way bigger or I lost two and picked up four. Like, who knows? Every year was a, a reshuffle of the people that were supporting you and you kind of got that deal done at Interbike and Interbike was a great time for me to get a deal done because Neural Disorder would always do a video premiere. So everybody just saw my video part and they're gassed up Yeah, and, uh, and it was, you know, and I'm still on Red Bull and GoPro and, um, so I was just, I always felt pretty high value in the bike world for just such a long time. And then you know, COVID comes around and it's like reshuffles the whole deck. Like the, um, the industry doesn't have bikes. You can't sell them. Um, you know, everybody bought everything already. So do you really need an ambassador or somebody showing you how awesome our suspension fork is when you, you, yeah, you, they owe a million forks to all these different brands to get them off and running. Like they don't need to sell a whatever, let's say a couple hundred oddball forks. Like they need to kind of streamline their, their, uh, their budget. And I, it just really changed for me. And plus I was 40. So it kind of changed for me too. Then like I was just, getting burnt out on the whole thing uh especially when it's not when you're not seeing the the same support um as years past and you're comparing your salary this year to your salary five years ago and you're watching it just trickle down and um yeah i don't know i i don't even know how to tell kids how to get sponsored these days people are like how do i get into it i'm like uh, be the best uh, like yeah i was gonna say ab- isn't like the absolute best isn't that the wrong question yeah like how to get sponsored it comes up a lot i mean it's technically the wrong question in the beginning yes if you can show me a cv 
that's winning everything and and other people that are way worse at sponsorship yeah we could look at your cv and look at your deck and i could help you with that but is it i mean that's still the wrong question how to get sponsored they should be asking you how to get better or do you think i should do free ride or race or where do you think my skill set is what can i improve on those would be better questions wouldn't it yeah i don't even know i i don't even know what like an emil johansson gets paid these days like i don't know how that works. i don't know like, either i'd love to know you know what i mean <laughs> what what did you make at the height of it then and i mean i guess there was yeah free riding so different to mount to racing because we had no. salaries plus bonuses plus they paid you expenses you had a pro contract in racing yes. so you you did both styles like i thought free riding was hard difficult to to make a living because they i mean you guys had some travel budgets i heard but and maybe if you oh, were yeah. specialized, you had a card that some uh, athletes misspent on and that got taken away. Ah. <laughs> um, Are we talking about Jordy's classic yeah. misspending of his specialized Yeah, but card I, heard, and- I heard it was an honest mistake that the other cards were getting bounced first. And that was like last resort to not get beaten up. And that's the butchered version I've heard. Yes. So like it was an honest mistake. And last resort to use the card. It wasn't like a naughty. Let's use the corporate card. <laughs> At so the gentlemen's club in Vegas. Oh, yeah. There's some things that you probably don't want to do, but I mean, I don't know. What's the least? What's the what's the consequence on both sides? You're like, I need to pay my tab and get the heck out of here, or I'm gonna get beat up by the bouncer. So I know. Um, but yeah, it was cool. Uh, so uh, Jordy, uh, um, Bearclaw, and Straight all had specialized credit cards. I never had a company credit card like with my name on it, and and it didn't ever go to my account. I never had that. I got reimbursed. So uh, ninety eight, I got a bike and a jersey and a helmet. And then ninety nine, Sobe signed on, and I got and I and I got a letter in the mail saying, "Come back and race for us, and we'll pay you ninety six hundred dollars this year." And I was like, "Woo, ninety six hundred bucks!" So, um, that was my first real paycheck, and that was just um, quarterly, I'm sure, at the time. And that was just for one team. So like I couldn't get another sponsor and make more money when I left. And I don't remember the most I made racing. Um, I don't really remember what that was, but it was not near what I was making with free ride. Cause then I left and got paid probably somewhere around a hundred or 120 from Cannondale really you had a six-figure frame deal yeah where that was at the height when movies were a big if you were in the movie parts that's big for them because it was before the like kind of internet and social media right i also had a signature bike with those guys and i was doing r d with those guys because i live like a few hours away you know so i had six years of signature bikes with those guys um And we had worked on a lot of different little projects. Um, But anyway, I was real tight with those guys there. um, I had a $20,000 travel budget that I blew the heck. I blew that thing out of the water every year and they kept paying it. It never capped ever. Oh, nice. (laughs) Nice. No. And like like I would go to California and go hang out with McCall and Aptos uh, and ride the... um, Ride the jumps. Post office. Jeez. Jeez. Yeah, post office in Aptos. Oh, you yeah. see some smoke coming out of my ears for that one. So we go <laughs> ride the jumps and everything else. And I would do that every single month as as a, you know, hey, I got new bikes and new sponsors. I got to get out there and I got to shoot the bike and I got to shoot the new sponsor gear and I got to stay sharp. And so I would, I was constantly using my travel budget um, making money on the side and 
uh, oh, and, and then also all the other sponsors, like Maxis has been one of my longest running sponsors. That's always been a couple thousand bucks. Um, but you get, let's say, a dozen sponsors to all throw a lump of money in the hat, and it adds right up, especially when some of those sponsors are GoPro and Red Bull. Um, I've had, I've worked with, you know, Degree Body Spray, Lava Soap. Uh, You've had a soap for- sponsor? Yeah, Ford. <laughs> Ford, I got, I got a, I got a yeah, truck Ford's, for two years. Ford's normal and cool, but you had a soap sponsor? Dude. Well, why not? Breaking into the mountain bikers gets stinky. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, all, just all these different um, sponsors, you know, coming in and out over the years. Uh, but, yeah, I would I, I made over 200 for a good grip of years, probably – shoot six to ten years or something like that somewhere that's in good there. man as as you, as you should that's money. good shit yeah that is, that's decent yeah. then and that's not just flying out of europe and risking it for nothing you know that's good that it can pay off like that yeah i bet there's really not that many free riders making that now because it's like it's so there's so much more competition and depth in yeah. uh, free riders a few guys that do rampage and then there's a meal and and you got Seminex still, and and Reader's now. You know he's back at it, but not competing. There's some big ass names, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the all those guys uh, I know are you know making some good money. I don't know if it's the same these days. Um, uh, it's good to see guys like Seminook be able to kind of dig his heels up, do what he does best, and then also get support from. Subaru and you know other companies while he's doing his other passion which is racing or or filming you know so it's all like he seems like the model for free ride these days because he can pick and choose what he wants to do and do what he does best and blow minds and all that but I think even Seminook said it not too long ago on a podcast or whatever he said something about like He's like, you can put the best seggy together and like maybe nobody even sees it. He's just like, you don't even know. Like you can put a good fun feeling segment together where you've got a like Danny McCaskill where he's got like a baby in the in the buggy behind his bike and he's doing jumps with the baby and stuff like that. And that thing gets a bazillion hits. And he's like, you know. Aaron over fences. He did do that barrel roll thing with the with the baby on there. But besides that, it was like he was doing a lot of stuff like, you know, cutesy stuff, like flying down steps and and shit like that. Um, so you just like what's the recipe now? Like like yeah, what imagine, is the re- what, what, you, what, what, you know what would I mean? you do if you had the, the talent and the age on your side now? I, you you need to you need to put something together like Imaginate, which is like everything shot like it's little tiny tiny toys, and then there's a storyline, and it's like relatable um, to like the common yeah. person that doesn't ride almost. Like my mom could watch that stuff, or maybe has oh, yeah. watched one or two, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, she knows of mountain biking through me, but still, it would be like her friends would be like, "Oh, doesn't your son do mountain biking? Look what I watch," and it would be Danny McCaskill riding on little toy weird things and then we know how gnarly some of the tricks that he does are yeah but dude back in the day it would be like hey let's bring the camera to the bar because everyone's going to be over there doing some wild stuff and we'll pick up a couple shots and i'll sprinkle that into one of the the montages but it was always like just bring the camera with us and if you're feeling like you want to try something wild i'll you know, I'll film it, you film me, whatever. Um, or you'd be riding, trying to get the meat of, of your section or your video, which is riding. But it was just like living as wild as you can, trying to get as much of it on film as you can. So you can put together a wild video, um, without any real repercussions. So, Killing Time opens up with a scene of me and another guy fighting in a store and knocking the shelves over and dumping sodas on the the kid's head and 
you know, uh, totally trashing the store and being total assholes. But uh, no one said boo. It's like such bad behavior. And uh, but you put in a DVD and everyone's like, this fucking DVD is awesome. You guys, you guys <laughs> yeah. are crazy. <laughs> they you think know? it's just like a movie. It's fake. Yeah. I like guess yeah, if exactly. it's in a DVD, it is. But on social media, yeah. it's, you get canceled right. in a hurry. Right. Somebody can chime in and be like, dude, you're an asshole. You just, that's somebody's store and you just fucking smashed all the chips on the ground. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> for, for, you know, like, I'm like, I don't know. We were, it was one night. We were trying to get some crazy footage. So we went and got some crazy footage and put it in the movie and then didn't even think twice about it. <laughs> oh, man. It has, it has changed that. Eh? Like you said, oh, yeah. how would you even tackle filming now you know like like an incredible writing part could not get picked up by the algorithms or by uh, if there's not enough ad, you know spend on it it doesn't get out there either by the sponsors as well but anybody can do it and put it out in the universe and maybe it'll catch traction but I, the only reason people were seeing me is because I was locked in with the free ride guys and, or, or, or the other guys making the movies and, um, you know, and, and, and there, there you go. Now everyone's got their own, uh, platform to show whatever they do. And, and, and now it's super oversaturated, but back in the day it was, you know, you'd buy, a couple of bike bike movies a year just to kind of see check the temperature and see what people are doing and and if you were fortunate enough to be on those rosters you were a god you know yeah definitely but if you were good enough someone would spot you and you'd be in the next new all disorder like yeah there was a bros club there for sure right but if you were good enough, you know, be so good they can't ignore you is probably what you could say to someone asking about being sponsored. If yeah. your goal is to be sponsored, fine, or pro. I mean, you just got to be so good, no one, we just can't ignore you, you know. And that's where racing is obviously easier, like the clock does not lie. Um, oh, whereas no. some, you know, and I, and that, that have, I mean, remember, um, What's his face? Hart. His last name was Hart. The decline. Scott Hart. Yeah, Scott Hart, of course. Um, and uh, he was quoted to say, "Well, you, you know, like, yeah, you can buddy up with a photographer as a racer and and get some cool stuff, but you, you know, like when I won a race, he's like, you know, then at least the credibility's there. You know, it's not just because he's unique or doing hill clickers on the four cross track that he's getting coverage." Yeah. He can also, you know, like the clock doesn't lie. But I do think, you know, video parts don't lie either, you know? No. No, especially if you put together a good one and people, like, are really moved. It was fun. So, like, Lenowski and I would always bullshit about stuff, and we'd be like, all right, so we're, we're watching our video part, and, and, you know, Jeff's like, all right, I'm, you know, I've got 20 clips in my video part last year. I've got 28 clips in my video part this year. I... I feel like I did better. I leveled up and this and that. And then he would be like, but what do you do if you're Cedric? And I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, Cedric is like, is he riding faster in his video part this year? I don't know. Is he? And I, he's just like looking at shit like, uh, you know, trying to trying to compare things the same. But if you had a video part where you were the one that was like ripping trails and riding fast, that's always harder to compare to than doing tricks like so for me i was heavily bmx influenced um but also i didn't have it, so i wanted to do flips like a flip to fakie and hand plants over the tree and stuff like that but it was all like trial and error stuff like i didn't have a, we didn't have a foam pit to practice a big hand plan on it was just over and over and over again until you get it um and for me i quickly would realize that the special moves that i did that were so much different were more coveted than the ones where i tried to 
keep up with the rest of the herd. Like if I flipped a really big jump in my video part, nobody was like, dude, that jump you flipped was ridiculous. Like I never got that. It was always like, dude, you crashed into a guitar solo. Like, are you fucking kidding? That was awesome. And so it was always like the dumb or more unique. I could be the, those were my bangers. Uh, Robbie Borden would do two heinous jumps that no one else would ever want to do. And that was his section. And then in between that was him doing like wall rides and cutties down a trail and, and everything else. And then he had a heinous jump in the beginning and one at the end. And that's his video part. And it's freaking ridiculous. And no one else can do that either. Um, mine was like, you know, I really wanted to put my own stamp on, well, like everybody, on your seggy and make it something that was extra special. So um, I would always try to think out of the box. So I was probably one of the first guys to do like a flip to fakey on like a dirt quarter um, or definitely a hand plant. Um, and I did that hand plant over that tree in Australia. And that really put put me on the map with some real BMX guys at the time. Cause I remember these guys were talking about it and I was like, dude, that was me. And they're like, that was you that did them. Like that was me. Um, I did the neutral gear. Did you ever try messing around with a little blank gear on your cassette? Uh, my brother and I might have, I was really bad at riding fake even <laughs> with a neutral, but you also did the winch thing, like the wakeboard winch oh, yeah. is it, it's called a winch, right? Yeah. So that was kind of outside the box. Yeah, yeah. High speed winds to get you into, instead of, you know, getting you into sort of uphill obstacles. And it was all, yeah. <laughs> right. You were super unique, like versatile and super unique. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd always try to come up with some, some sort of prop or something else like that. And dude, that winch was wild. I still have it actually. Really? Yeah. So it's through, a 13 horsepower. Red Bull that you got it or what? Yeah. Yep. Yep. And, and that was in the day where I think I broke my femur and, um, I wrote them up something. I was watching like fuel TV and they were doing all this like winch wake skate stuff. And I was like, I wonder if I could get towed like into shit, like uphill, like towed uphill into it. Like I'm picturing like a step up into a quarter and then a step back down, but the step down had like a grind box on it. So I built some pretty unique stuff and made that happen. And that winch was really pretty fun. Um, I don't see anybody else kind of doing anything like that these days. It's just, it's a weird kind of a thing to, it's a lot of, it's a lot of work to get something like that made and built and everything. But anyway, it was a blast to, uh, to, to fuck with. And, um, and then have that neutral gear uh, and and try to showcase that. I tried it at one point um, getting that thing packaged and for sale, and I sold it through a company named SIC, and uh, they just didn't have distribution enough to move it or anything like that. And but it is still something that people run today as a neutral gear. Like I don't think there's enough on. people with the talent to use that thing. No offense. Like it's quite a well, the slope it's a style, niche guys. thing, but it's so difficult yeah. to do it properly, isn't it? Well, for you, it's not. Yeah. Well, no, nah, it's it takes practice like anything, but you shift down into it, and then you do your move, and then you come back out of your move, and you have to be coasting, and then you shift back up out of. Okay, it. hang on, hang on, hang on. We, we for the listener and even on YouTube, what he's saying when he does a move, you have to ride down the road, and you have to bunny up 180 that in itself is like 0.0001 percent of the world on a bike can do that <laughs> that's what i'm meaning to get into the coasting thing you've got to be able to bunny up 180 people are like we've lost them already i can barely yeah. bunny up 180 anymore <laughs> and then land perfectly and then coast backwards people are like what are these guys talking about yeah so it was stuff like that that gave me I felt like a little bit more edge in that new world or arena or those videos um, because it was just, it was something that it was, it was like that fuckery that people see and they're like, is that a magic trick? Like how come that 
worked the way that it did. Um, and I always was attracted to skateboarders that would do the weirdest tricks, like kick your board, it bounces off the wall, it comes back, he hops on it and then drops in and you're like, what? That's how he starts his run or, you know, just like weird, um, almost magic trick stuff. Um, so I always wanted to like apply some of that to, to the video projects and, you know, that's all where your creativity comes in, where I think the, the, the audience appreciates like seeing something like weird and new. It's gone a little bit away from that. I must say, I mean, unless I'm missing something, you know, Matt McDuff was into his street and all this weird, unique stuff. And you rode with him a bit at some of his compounds, mm -hmm. but it's gone very big air. Like soap style is as street as it could get some, there's not even obstacles on a slope style. That would be kind of no, street, right? Big, it's really mountain jumps. biking is really dis, uh, you know, gone its own way. Right. Would you say? Mm hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think that there's still plenty of guys out there that do the weirdness. Um, but yeah, I, I think the guys that are higher up, or maybe I should just say the events that are higher up are really concentrating on just big dirt jumps. They're, they're just big. Like Crankworks used to have, I mean, they always had big jumps in it, but they also, they, they also had like normal, like they had like an eight foot drop in it one year and people were doing like Regakin did like a fast plant three whip off of like the eight foot drop, like a head high drop. Um, I just think that the competition sport in general is a little redlined. Um, and whenever I would design the district ride course, I would try to bring things back down to more of like a digestible size so that you might see, um, some of these guys, their the moves that they do on their video parts, you might actually see that in a contest setting. And I always felt like with these contests, you're always you're always building it bigger, like big white or you know crankworks or you name it, the Bear Claw Invitational. It was just it just kept getting bigger and bigger and crazier and gnarlier and um. And you would lose the the smaller stuff that could turn into something. Here's the last thing I was going to say with this contest. I would watch two dudes, like Daniel Dares and a, B and a BMX um, park contest would flare and trick every single thing. He'd be like pinballing off of everything, doing all the tricks. And then Morgan Wade would drop in and do like a huge pocket air gap and then come back and jump over the rafters and land like, you know, and wall ride the wall and come back into the quarter. And, you know, these two guys would ride so different on the same course. And I wanted, I really always wanted to see slope style have a little bit more of their options open because mm. I think, guys like when drew bizanson was trying to get into slope style um he's just as awesome as all those other guys on a mountain bike he's just not that he's not as good as doing big drops and big dirt jump tricks as greg watts is but if they're if you put that slope style, that same slope style, and you squeezed it a little bit together. So there was an option here or there, or he could wall ride the side of the building or pop up and install one of the rafters or something like that. that's what he's known for in a skate park is to, is jumping out of the arena and then jumping back into the arena with slope style. It's just one line. It's just big dirt jumps and and I think you get a little bit more of the repetitive tricks and stuff like that um, because the options aren't all there. Yeah, that makes sense. It would be cool if you could leave it more open to interpretation and some options and then your unique riding styles could come out. Because like you say, there's just some riders could be super creative and it's a super difficult trick, but it's not on the biggest obstacle. That doesn't mean you couldn't maybe score pretty similar but yeah they've just kind of done it one line and there's six to seven big hits now you know yeah i like that audi nines uh contest that they do in that pit that's pretty cool 
Oh yeah, like that is it. that is pretty cool. So you're still yeah. watching the comps, like what, what's what do you like to do in your spare time? I'm watching UFC fights, man. Yeah, I really like. Yeah, I really like watching two dudes pound the crap out of each other. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's I don't know what it is. Yeah, there's that, and um, I'm really working towards my next level of my career. So what COVID kind of slowed down my bike sponsorship game. And now this year, it, you know, this month is the last month to get paid by common Saul, And that's it for me. I don't have any more bike sponsors. Um, I've got too many friends in the industry that will help me and hook me up, but I'm no longer an athlete whatsoever. Um, I'm going through a divorce in my life right now which, you know, is what it is. I've uh, been married for 18 years and just can't keep the camp together anymore. Uh, I just think after a while, um, so much happens in somebody's life and there's still so much life left that sometimes the two people need to part ways so that they can continue on whatever their journey is that, that they need to be on. Um, and staying married to one person and loyal to one person and, and all in with one person is extremely difficult, especially traveling and having the life that we have and going all over the place. And it's good to have somebody solid back at home, but you know, life is fluid and changes and I got to, change with the times too. So, <clears throat> so right now I'm doing that. I'm doing work around that, uh, around here, around, um, where I live in central New Hampshire, um, site work, like in a machine, um, I was doing septic tanks and leach fields and driveways and gutters, not gutters, but like drainage and, you know, just all digging in the dirt stuff that I've always done. Um, I like digging in the dirt. Uh, but, um, this is all a bit of a placeholder for something larger. And, um, I've got a couple different opportunities, but the biggest one is, um, five years ago, I was brought in to a team that's looking to develop a town in the foothills of the Smoky mountains down in Tennessee. Um, and I would be the part of my role in the team would be, uh, to create the bike park. Um, so it's a development on a scale that it would be, it would have its own power grid and power plant, um, out and it's a town based off of outdoor lifestyle, um, and, uh, whitewater rafting, sport fishing, um, it's just one of those things that I'm able to use my expertise over the years and connections um, to get this going. Uh, it's just on such a large level that I'm in a holding pattern waiting for written permission from the state of Tennessee, which starts all of the TIFs and bonds and incentives that opens up all the other private funding that gets me paid and then that gets the whole ball rolling. So. I mean, it, it, this 2024 should be my year. I'm really looking forward to it happening because creating your own bike park from scratch, from the ground up, especially with a group of guys that are developing a, a, a town around So it. a town from scratch. There's 800 people in this town right now. Okay. And so, yeah, basically. And they, and that's all, and that's how fascinating is it that they've earmarked a bike park as one of the facets, right? Like there's full time yeah. trail builders and bike parks exist. And oh, yeah. Crankworks in the summer has more people through the Crankworks week has more people through Whistler than a winter weekend, you know, from right. tourists to bikers that help and, and, and all that and golf and stuff. But like how fascinating, you know, whereas maybe retiring. 20 years ago for both you and I, there wasn't really an acceptance of the sport as a culture. Like in South Africa, it's one of the fastest growing, if not the fastest growing is, is mountain biking, cycling, the Cape oh, yeah. Epic, 
these events, you know, and every second person I went to high school was just getting a bike or getting into it. And, and I was always the guy that I was the weird BMX kid, they thought, because they didn't even, yeah. mountain biking really wasn't a sport. Yeah, no, it's true. Um, I, it feels like to me, um, I could have been uh, Hans Ray and just sponsored forever. But I, I, I don't even think that's possible anymore. I really don't. I don't know how to make that happen. But I thought for quite a while, like, hey, I'm kind of grandfathered in. I could probably just be in the bike industry on any level and kind of keep it going. But that is not easy, dude, at all to retain sponsorship anymore. So, um, Yeah, it's draining, right? Like you almost yeah. sometimes you feel like there's value and there was, um, but you maybe, maybe feel like you're groveling and – and that's tough. So it sounds like there were signs that it was tough at times through COVID, but also you mentally and internally looked at it and decided, okay, well, what is what does long, long term look like? And 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 this opportunity you founded, it kind of came to you. Like, how does something like this happen? So it came to me through Brad J. Brad J is the announcer for Rampage. Yeah, um, yeah I worked yes. with Brad. Yeah, yeah. Well, alongside. Yeah. Not yet. So he's awesome. He's done every event, uh, surf, skate, bike, um, Olympics, uh, you know, all sorts of stuff. And he's a real good dude. Um, he buddied up with this guy who's developing, who's trying to do this whole development. And I was the bike side of it. So to see if I can get that role. And, um, we're really, really close to funding once we get uh, the written permission from the state of Tennessee. The good part is that the state needs to spend these incentives and they also need this to happen to turn on tax revenue back to back to the state and everything else. And this money is up for grabs. And so it's anyway, it's all happening. We We, we own a bunch of real estate in town and stuff like that. So it's um, it's all super exciting. I'm just kind of waiting for that to hit. And in the meantime, doing some work around here, um, you know, I've got split custody of my kids. So, uh, I physically need to be here half the time. I can't just hop on the road and skedaddle like I used to. So, uh, but it's all good. I've, I feel like I've kind of gotten that fire out of me of, you know, riding and traveling and doing all that stuff. And I definitely now have a newer kind of lease on life. Like every day is, is my own and it's what I make it now. I don't have to okay it with, uh, through a, a partner anymore or anything like that. So plus I love where I live. This is my, you know, log home right here in New Hampshire. Um, I've got property and uh, a barn and friends. Highlands, a stone's throw away. It's 10 minutes down the road. Um, so I just live in a great spot. And this is the town that I grew up in and that my dad moved us to when I was in fourth grade and built our house. So I'm just living back home and um, living comfortably right now, which is great. And, uh, and just moving through to my next, you know, business venture and, Hoping that, uh, hoping that that kicks off, so I'm not a uh, an electrician or something like that in town. Or the or the bitter guy at the 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 bar, as you said, you got bitter earlier than 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 some. But um, do you think it's like a death, like stopping a career, like like sport and me, it's racing. Like there's some of it you got to say good, but there's like a mourning period, I think. Yeah, I think uh, it would be a lot harder if I didn't go through what I went through in 07 with my back. Okay. Um, because I've felt a decline for a while, at least just like in my riding. Um, so it's not like it just sort of fell apart for me. But I think it's like anything. Uh, I, I heard a good analogy. It's like being a model and you lose your looks, you know, and it's just father time robbing that shit from you but at the same time i'm 45 i'm in great shape um you know i could i still got it um 
So, so that feels good. Um, and also feels good that I've, I, I went out and did it all too. Like, um, you know, I put a lot out there. Um, I, I did a lot. You could always do more. Um, but I could always have missed that sponsor and missed the whole train, or I could have sheared my spine instead of burst fractured it and not be walking. Like, so man, 19 years with Red Bull, 17 years with Cannondale and 17 years with uh, GoPro. So, you know, I, and, and I, I think longer with Maxis. I think I've been on Maxis for 21 years. Dude, I, you clearly did something right, man. I think you need a huge pat on the back and you've paved the oh, yeah. way for for many a career, man. Inspired many people to to follow, you know, in your footsteps and kind of go against the grain of, you know, it was going big mountain and you went more street and more unique and more hardtail when mountain biking wasn't really that, you know? No. No, it wasn't, but I, I, I did figure out early on that to, to stick with what you're, what you're great at or exceptional at. Um, I, you know, I tried to keep up when it came to big tricks on big jumps. And then I was like, I don't need to do this anymore because what I do, I can't McCall can't do whatever. You know what I mean? Like I'd do something stupid and he'd be like, man, I wish I could make that happen. But he's, you know one of the sickest riders to ever ride a bike and he can trick any shoddy, weird, scary step down. And every time I hit it, I'd be dead sailoring and he could do a pendulum off of it. Like it's just different, different strokes for different folks. I don't know you're just different. People are good at different things. Yeah. I think that's what, what a way to wrap it up, dude. Just yeah. stick to, really double down on what you really good at and you followed your passion and like you say i think we're both lucky you know when we really calm it down in 20 years or whatever and we're all those bitter guys at the bar we get to say we went out there and tried um so uh, i'm thankful to that as well you know dude how much fun was it like at the you'd get done it would be the sunday of some big race in like Kavark and Rennie just did well, and they're like murdering a bottle of Jack, just, Grah! and then you know, everyone's running around town, and like you're bumping into your buddies everywhere, and you're like, "Well, oh, there it is, Neefling and those guys, or whatever, you know." And and then I don't know, it was just there was just it was just such a fucking adventure. It was so much fun. Um, it was before social media took off and everybody I don't know was more accountable this was like you get wild and and not everyone's filming it or whatever I don't know what I'm even trying to say it was just you get away with more I guess it was just more innocent yeah yeah you, no you 100% could you could be more yourself I'm not condoning condoning like partying but I think I would be lying if it wasn't part of the relaxation or relief after an event of that pent up adrenaline, pent up emotion and, and sacrifice up to a big event. And then uh, it was like spring break all over, you know? Yeah. Well, you and you're together. far from home and you're like, and everyone's celebrating and you're like, let's get yeah, out there. It's, so, yeah, it's, um, it was a fucking great time. Um, what a ride, and, huh? Yeah, what a ride. And I I would have more memories if I didn't smoke my head along the way too. So <laughs> likewise. <laughs> dude, I I mean I I think uh dude, props for your career, props for all you went through and, and coming back from which I don't know, some people might not have got back on a bike and that was scary what oh. you went through. Yeah, you physically were able to do it, but mentally, um dude, no. Thanks, thanks for all the memories. I think it's what a fitting time to do a podcast with this next transition of yours to sort of say, yeah. I'm not going to be sponsored anymore and I'm going to go in and go in a different direction. Yeah, it's scary. It's a little sad, but the sponsorship world, um, it's just harder and harder to, to hang on to and it just seems 
it seems like every company is just like eh, budget cuts. Uh, we might be able to do, and you're just like, dude, god damn! Like, I remember when it was, you know, we want you and they want you. So, like, let us know when what you figure out, and I hope you guys come with us. You know, and you, you, hmm. uh, just so many more options and. But whatever, maybe it'll come back around. It seems like, uh, I mean, the opportunities are still out there. You could podcast, which is cool, and everything else. And you've been doing this for a while now. Yeah, a little bit. Well, COVID was yeah. the definitely uh, sort of what spearheaded it. I thought about it for 10, 15 years before that. Um, yeah. And and it, and it is, yeah. It's been it's been quite the journey, man. I must say, and yeah, content's an interesting game to play. Um, it's not always the most fulfilling, um, but I enjoy it. I enjoy it. And I think people get value out of it. And I, and I think that's where we're also missing is the story behind the rider, the story behind the edit. Um, cause everyone's so fascinating, you know? Yeah. Well, and you got a great position cause now you know everybody and you got a good channel and you know, awesome list of contacts that probably keeps snowballing every time you do one, you're like, Hey, set me up with somebody. Who who do you got? And <laughs> yeah, I should going, actually. So good. I should actually leave. Like, there's some of these podcasts have like leave a question for the next person or whatever. I should be like, well, give me an idea for the next guest. You know? Yeah. Uh, have you had McDuff on? I have early on. Yeah, I loved it. Because what's he doing over at his place? He looks like he's building what? some scary oh, stuff. Oh, now yeah, he's building a lot of scary stuff. Yeah. I saw Reynolds went out there. I'll probably see him for Dark Fest in Feb. Mm -hmm. He'll come out. So, yeah, he's transitioned like it's Big Air McDuff or whatever his nick now his nickname is. <laughs> he was podcasting for a bit. I think it's on ice at the moment. Yeah. So he was yeah. podcasting and sort of telling that injury journey, which you'd be a good guest if he ever brings it on again. I don't know. Did you go on his show? I did, yeah. I yeah, did. that's what I thought. Yeah, 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 yeah. Dude, he's a crazy dude. He's such a good dude. <laughs> that he's, he's such a good dude. dude. So here, that I'll, I'll leave you. I'll leave you with. Fuck. I'll leave. Yeah, dude. Oh my god. How All right, leave me with die? a nugget. And and how did we not? I still have not seen that footage. I haven't seen him go. Okay, dropping in. Whoa, smell splat. I still haven't seen that clip. Yeah, because it, I need to. I right? feel like I watched it for the. Well, I didn't want to watch it. I might have put my hands over my eyes. <laughs> but I don't know who owns it or if it went on a paid for video or something. I need to ask him where that is. I don't know either. I haven't really seen it. But, it's disgusting. Uh, um, you don't so, want to see it. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, so I did a video series called Mountain Mods where I was building unique tricks and I'm building unique obstacles for unique tri tricks. So the one that I built here at my house was like an on off box that you could do half cap tricks on. So I, I had McDuff come over for it and he's like, I'll come and do your video, but you got to come and do my party master tour. And, uh, this summer. And I was like, all right, cool, let's do it. So party master tour is where he does a trip through like an area in, 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 um, Canada, um, with a band with, with a couple different bands and they do like psychedelic shows. And it's just like, it's pretty cool and pretty awesome. Um, but I, traveled around with him the bands and 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 a group of guys riding um we went to his mom's house first and we did yoga in her garden and we ate vegetables and like a big scrambled egg vegetable thing in the morning and very zenful and then we drove to matt's dad's house <laughs> <laughs> and dude matt's dad lives in a cabin out in the woods on the side of this lake um and he's a wild man and we partied there for two days two nights we built a jump off of his dock we took his boat out we went on this big rope swing on an island we did all of this stuff and it was so much fun to see the two sides of mcduff i was gonna the, say that makes so much sense the spiritual, gentle, caring, connected to earth in your body, yes. mom side, and then the wild man who's just can't be, can't be, uh, can't be contained. Yeah, can't be yeah. tamed. Yeah, 
Dude, that's that's great. I'm going to ask him more about that when he's here. Chase, yeah. dude, this has been unreal, man. And thanks for everything you've done in the industry. And uh, I look forward to staying in touch and hearing more about your, your these future plans, man. I'm holding thumbs. It sounds like an exciting project. Yes, buddy, me too. And uh, yeah, congrats to you too, dude. It's good to see you and rap with you. And it's I'm looking at the map above your head. You're in Africa. I'm in yeah. the United States and we're just shooting the shit. Dude. And this it's one here cool. is my uh, local bike park that I help with. I don't build as much. Yeah, I help manage and run that a little bit. And that's like the, the map of the trails and my brother and our bike shop's like at the bottom. So um, yeah. yeah full circle as well and i'm sure we'll share many stories and probably around two when you're in your next venture and maybe i'm in my next venture yeah let's absolutely let's do it yeah dude that'd well, be a lot of fun yeah peace out you guys know what to do if you enjoyed it share it with a friend and we are on youtube so make sure you go to moving the needle podcast on youtube and you could have if you're on there, thanks very much because you would have seen those gnarly screws that Aaron Chase had just spoken about, but maybe you need to go and see the screws. So head over to the YouTube channel and follow Chase along because I'm sure he's going to share some of the new adventures with you on his Instagram. Till the next one, peace.